Congregation, I invite you to turn in your copies of God's Word to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 30 of this chapter. Luke chapter 4 is found on page 1024 in the Bibles provided. Luke chapter 4. Well, Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit, that same Holy Spirit came to rest on him. And that same Spirit drove him into the wilderness where Satan has tempted him. Now, Satan was unsuccessful in getting Jesus to serve himself or worship a false god or even to throw himself from the temple. But that serpent, or sorry, Satan departed, we're told, verse 13 of this chapter, until an opportune time. Well, Luke proceeds quickly towards such an opportune time that was available in Jesus' hometown, Nazareth. And this event uh, happening early in Jesus' ministry prepares us for what is going to happen uh, toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And so here now as I read Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. This is the word of God. Let us hear him. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard in your, you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray for his blessing upon it. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the things that we've been singing this morning of him and Lord of this, your word, which tells of uh, this particular point in his earthly ministry. Uh, Lord, help us to see our Savior. And Lord, would you in this time as we hear your word read, as we hear it preached, Lord, would you give your spirit Lord, that our hearts would be exposed. Lord, fill us then with love for you, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to repent of all sin and to embrace you as the glorious Lord you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that escalated quickly. At the start of this passage, Jesus is being glorified by all. And even in Nazareth, all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words. All their eyes were attentive to him. And yet just seven verses later, they are seeking to throw him from a cliff. This passage shows how Jesus elicited strong responses, strong emotions, strong uh, reactions to his ministry. And yet n not all of those were positive. But Why? In reading this passage, it escalates so quickly that one wonders, why the change? Did Jesus say something to agitate the people to attempt murder? Uh, whatever he did, it exposed what was in their hearts. 
And in fact, that's the very thing I want us to see this morning that Jesus still does today. Jesus exposes hearts. He, let him expose your heart this morning. And then let us trust in him. Let your heart be exposed this morning. And first we see the Spirit's power in Jesus' teaching. Teaching. Luke summarizes Jesus' Galilean ministry in verses 14 to 15. And we know this is a sum- summary because Matthew and John, and John include a lot of other details. Uh, for instance, Jesus worked many miracles, water into wine, various healings. Uh, Matthew summarizes the same ministry in a different way, giving a bit more detail. Matthew 4, 23, and, and, and saying, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, that's basically what Luke says, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And so some of this Luke is going to detail later, but now he states simply, verse 14, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went throughout all the surrounding country. Now, obviously, as we will see in verse 23, news does get around that Jesus is is working wonders, is a wonder worker. And that may be how many would expect a ministry, using Luke's words, in the power of the Spirit. You know, there's got to be some some display of miracles and signs, the the Spirit's at work. Now, of course, Jesus did have the Holy Spirit rest on him in his baptism. That same Spirit did drive him to be tempted in the wilderness. And that is to say that this Spirit is still equipping Jesus through all the ministry we're reading of here. And yet, nevertheless, Luke summarizes the Galilean ministry in this way. He taught in their synagogues. I think there's a connection that Luke wants to make here, and that is that that this is spirit-empowered ministry. Luke is right to summarize it in this way because the signs that Jesus did were in support of his preaching. The wonders were given to attest Jesus' message, and we're going to see that as we come to the ones which Luke does detail later in this chapter and others. And seeing the, Jesus, the, the Spirit-filled ministry as w- one of teaching is important because the ongoing work of the Spirit in the church, even today, includes to teach. Isn't that, after all, what Jesus himself commanded the church to do? To make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We are right to cultivate hearts that desire to be taught as Christians. We're right to gather as his people, to to, to be taught from the scriptures. Jesus taught. And then we have, as a particular example, Luke records for us Jesus' teaching, his preaching in Nazareth, his hometown. And so let's see that Jesus reads at the synagogue. We learn a bit of Jesus' weekly passage, sorry, weekly practice in verse 16. We're told, as was his custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And now Luke not not only tells us this, but he's going to proceed to give examples showing this pattern. Verse 31, verse 44, chapter 6, verse 6, or chapter 13, verse 10. This was his customary behavior. It was his habit, his pattern. And, And that's, though, not to say that every Jew living at that time shared that habit, shared that custom. In fact, the author of the Hebrews tells us that we should not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some. Jesus' habit was to to gather, to be there. Now, if anyone could make the excuse that they didn't need church, Jesus surely could. If anyone could make the excuse that all those other people there are hypocrites, Jesus could because he literally was sinless. He was the son. He, he, He is fully God. And yet, this is his custom. He saw value in it, uh, made it his pattern to be there, not to mention that Jesus uh, literally, that he fulfilled all the law so that he could be our righteousness. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Jesus loved to worship his Father. And let's consider these things as we desire to be conformed to Christ. Now, while there in the synagogue, Jesus stood up to read. What's he reading? He is reading the scriptures. Again, we're seeing the type of ministry that the Spirit empowers. Jesus is anointed with the Spirit. He tells us as much from the passage he quotes. And to be anointed with the Spirit, that did not mean that he was beyond need of the, script, of the Scriptures. Quite the opposite. We find that Jesus' ministry includes reading and expounding of Scripture. Specifically, Jesus read from Isaiah 
largely a quote from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, but with a language also from this taken from a few chapters prior in Isaiah. Uh, that these two are together is perhaps an indicator that Jesus read a larger portion, maybe even several chapters, or, or, or it could be that uh, his reading and explanation involved exposition, a, a laying out of the context of a passage so that it could be understood. He's, he's referencing uh, where this comes in Isaiah. Perhaps that's why uh, there's, a, there's a mix of the quotes together as they come, as they're recorded here by Luke. Uh, again, let us learn from Jesus as those who desire to be conformed to him. We want to hear God's word. The Apostle Paul affirms for us that Christian worship is to have the reading of God's word as part of what we do. 1 Timothy 4.13, he said, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. This is why every time as we gather as God's people to worship, we have a reading of God's word. We're really just following Jesus' pattern. We're, we're following the Spirit's guidance. We're doing what God has commanded and Jesus explains what he read, which Luke may be summarizing, or it may have been an incredibly short sermon. Verse 21, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, Jesus affirms here that Isaiah was writing about him. Isaiah, the, the, the prophets of old, those, those previously who'd been filled with the Spirit, they were looking forward to Jesus. They were seeing his glory. In particular, Christ is claiming that he is the one who is anointed with the Spirit. Anointed is the same word from which we, we know the term Messiah, uh, that, that's the Hebrew term, or Christ is, is the Greek equivalent. Jesus is proclaiming his identity. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And his anointing is not merely, as was done in the Old Testament, uh, with, with oil, as men were set aside as, as prophets or priests or kings. No, Jesus his anointing is with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is upon him. Remember, he was conceived by the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit descended and rested upon him bodily as, 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 as like a dove at his, at his baptism. And so this is who he is. This is his identity. And furthermore, this passage which he quotes and expounds here, he is revealing not only his identity, but also his mission. Uh, this actually be, may be what begins to start the tension between him and hear, his hearers. Because the passage from Isaiah speaks of a, a salvation that is needed. Now, Jesus brings salvation, and salvation implies that there are people in trouble. If you need salvation, that implies that you need something to be saved from. You're, you're not doing well in your current situation. Salvation implies that you're in peril. And Isaiah was replete with then with descriptors of those people who needed salvation, those of those people who were to look for who were looking forward to Messiah's coming. In the passage that Jesus read, good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed. And as Jesus interprets it, this year of the Lord's favor is not, as some might think, the year of jubilee, that single year in 50 when all, you, all debts are covered. Jesus is, is saying that it is today, good, today good news for all those poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. So thus far was Jesus' spirit-empowered scripture reading and teaching ministry at the synagogue in Nazareth. So let's then look at the response. And while it first may appear ambiguous, perhaps even uh, somewhat positive, we need to see clearly that the Nazarenes reject Jesus. The Nazarenes reject our Lord. At first, all did speak well of him. They marveled at his gracious words. And that sounds like a very positive response to Jesus. They notice his words are gracious. Jesus spoke of good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, and yet even as they're hearing that, maybe part of what they're marveling at is also revealing what their expectation is. Okay, he said, sight to the blind. That sounds like a miracle. And Jesus just said right from the, the, the pulpit, as it were, he said he's going to do this stuff. Now, we've, we've heard some of those marvels that he did. But wait, why is he just reading scripture now? Why is he just all talk here? Do you see what's going on? The wonders were meant to affirm Jesus' message. 
The signs and the miracles, miracles were not the star of the show, but the hearers got it backwards. They're saying the preaching, what he says, must just be a prelude to what we really want to see. Let's see the blind be given sight. Let's see a miracle, Jesus. Come on. But Jesus doesn't indulge them. And so they begin to discount him. They ask, is this not Joseph's son? Now, the idea is that, I mean, could a local carpenter be the Messiah? It's just showing that Jesus and who he really is, who he's just proclaimed himself to be in their presence, it just flies over their heads. They dismiss the thought. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. They treat him with contempt. <clears throat> and yet notice what, what they've missed. Uh, even though Jesus grew up in their midst, even though Jesus grew up at, in Nazareth, Jesus, oh, isn't this Jesus, Joseph's son? Well, well no. Jesus was not merely Joseph's son, not biologically. He was legally Joseph's son. He was adopted by him. He was raised in his household. But Jesus is the son of Mary who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. The identity that Luke is putting before us again and again is that Jesus is God's son. And his own neighbors blinded themselves to that, focusing only on appearances. Jesus could see what was going on in their hearts. He puts words to their doubts. Doubtless you will quote the pro to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. He is in part uncovering their craving for signs and miracles. Maybe to put it a different way, that they're essentially saying, you did it at Capernaum, do it here too. Again, do you see what they're doing? They're reducing Jesus who has just pronounced himself to be Messiah, to be the one who, 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 is, who is proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, who is bringing salvation, who is full of the Holy Spirit, to be a circus performer, a stage show. And, and the proverb cuts deeper. Physician, heal yourself, means that though Jesus will help the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed, essentially the Nazarenes listening to him are saying, look at yourself. If you're the physician, they're saying Jesus has something wrong that he needs to be healed of. They're saying the great physician himself is unwell. Now, what, what makes them reject Jesus like this? Well, it is in part spiritual blindness. Je Jesus, let me remind you, Jesus would not be recognized by a halo. <laughs> He didn't feel the need to constantly do miracles to make a name for himself. In fact, that was the very temptation that Satan uh, was, ha was, was, was giving to Jesus that Jesus has just overcame. He had no form or comeliness that men should desire him. And that means that for people to recognize him then, they needed the Holy Spirit. You, you this morning need the Holy Spirit. Yes, that same spirit which empowered Jesus and directed him to teach and to preach. That same spirit that rested on Jesus. You need today to, to, to recognize this Jesus for whom he is. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. So if you're here this morning and... You're just like, I don't think any of this makes sense. You, you've, you've, sung, you've sung the Psalms. You've heard the scripture readings. You're hearing what I'm preaching. You, you, hear, the, you hear about Jesus himself, and you're like, it just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Friend, the reality is we are all spiritually blind. We are all naturally needing something outside of ourselves to have our eyes open to see Jesus. You need that today, and I need that today. Jesus had neighbors who grew up next door to him, and they were blind to who he really was. And that shows another reason why they reject him. It is the reason of pride. It is pride to say that Jesus has to do for me what I want him to do. That is, if I hear Jesus working miracles elsewhere, then he has to do them for me. Although that's not an uncommon thought that I hear among people. If Jesus is real, uh, then why doesn't he do a miracle? I mean, I, I want to believe in Jesus, but, but I won't because, cause, cause, you know, he, I, I hear these things he did. Why doesn't he do it now? Well, behind that is a presumption. It is an assumption that Jesus owes it to you because he did it to somewhere, somewhere else, to someone else. 
in some ways, that's a, a covetousness. I, I want what, what Jesus did to others. I, I want it too. I, oh, I, I should have it too. Well, friends, uh, for, for Na- the Nazarenes, they had this covetousness. They had this presumption. They had this pride because he grew up in their town. That is, surely he's going to do the miracles for me because he's a Nazarene. Now, let me remind you that Nazarenes didn't have the best reputation among people in the world of that day. Uh, we, could, we could turn to John chapter 1 and you'd find that someone just dismisses Jesus at first uh, because they, uh, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was not a great place. And, and, and in some ways, we, we, we talked about this already earlier in Luke's gospel and that uh, Jesus, you know, Mary was, a, was a, a, a virgin, a young woman, of, a, 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 yes, a, yes, an actual virgin of Nazareth. That, that is showing God's gracious condescension and that Jesus would be, have any association with a place so ill esteemed, so 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 disliked in their own culture. And yet from this passage, we see that just because people are socially or politically despised doesn't mean that they are humble. Friends, I think that many people make that assumption today that if you if you're if you're if you're humble or if you're or sorry if you've been oppressed or if you've uh, if you've you you know people don't like you then you must be virtuous in some way. But in fact, here in this case, it seems that that is part of the fault they find in Jesus, is that they're not sharing his priorities. He's not sharing their priorities. That is to say that Jesus doesn't have to be for Nazarenes simply because he's a Nazarene. And yet, this group think is all too common to any group whether it's prideful Nazarenes or, or insert another label, a political or, or geographical or denominational label. The truth is Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. This rejection at Nazareth is at the beginning of his ministry prefigures that he will be despised, rejected of men, king of the Jews, but rejected by the Jews. And so what matters most is not the label you wear or the group you identify with. What matters is what have you done with Jesus? Don't think that only Nazarenes can have this sort of pride and presumption. I, I've seen it in people who have grown up in Christian families. I've seen it in people who take pride in their denomination. I've seen it in Pentecostals. I've seen it in Reformed and Presbyterians. I've seen it in preacher's kids. And if I'm honest, and I think if you're honest too, I think we have seen this sort of pride in our own hearts. What have you done with Jesus? Jesus. Is your loyalty to your team higher than your allegiance to him? And so Jesus gets to the point by making additional observations from Scripture. He, he goes back to the Scriptures, verses 25 to 27. Particularly, he taught that God's prophet blessed Gentiles. He's saying, Jesus, he's saying, I, I will bless Gentiles too. Jesus bl- will bless Gentiles. And the very fact that Jesus, though, makes this point from a passages which are about the time of Elijah says something. Because Elijah lived at a low point in Israel's history. All that to say that Jesus is pushing back on their presumption that something must be wrong with him. You know, physician, heal yourself. No, he's, he's saying, there's something wrong here, yes, but it's not with me. His point is, is that Elijah didn't minister to any of the Jewish widows, but only to the Sidonian. Elijah didn't, cleanse any, Elijah didn't cleanse any Jewish lepers, but only Assyrian. This, by the way, is, is maybe why Jesus didn't do, isn't doing any miracles for them. His ministry will be for those who are truly poor, captive, blind, and oppressed, even if they're not Israelites. He will go to the Gentiles as well. And that infuriated them. That was pouring gasoline on a fire, as we shall see, because they thought nothing could be worse than going, or, than going to the Gentiles, than being a Gentile. The Gentiles are scum of the earth. They're filthy. They're unclean. They're nothing like we, sons of Abraham. Again, that's pride. That's what Nazarenes thought of Gentiles. And yet, remember, Nazarenes themselves aren't very, thought very highly of. In some ways, this is like the the pot calling the kettle black. They're enraged because they viewed others as worthy, and and yet 
Who are they? They should be the ones who are humble. They should be recognizing uh, you're coming for the, the, the blind, the poor. Hey, that's us. Who needs a savior? Who needs a savior such as you? The salvation that you're proclaiming, Jesus, we do. Because there's not something not right with us. Now, in a way that Jesus says that he's going to Gentiles, that should, and I want us to see that that should be a joy to us this morning. Because I think in this room, we're, we're predominantly Gentiles. I mean, tell, tell me, how far is Shawnee, Kansas from ancient Israel? And yet Jesus came for you. He came to save you and I who were far off. We've been brought near. He came to save us who are strangers from the covenants of promise. And at the same time, as I want you to find joy in that. Jesus is going to the Gentiles. You need to beware. Because even a Gentile can become a Nazarene or a Pharisee at heart. Whom do you look down on and say they are so far? from the grace of God? Is it people with a certain political affiliation? Is it people who partake of certain media? Is it people who currently espouse a certain worldview and with it embrace a certain culture? And I'm not, it's not to say that I'm not saying that everything's unimportant or, or that there's, there's, no, there's no truth out there that needs to be discerned. But I, I'm asking, who is it that you in your heart have thought that Jesus couldn't go to? Search your heart here. Do you think that the gospel would be of no use to certain people, maybe on the basis of their foolishness or their ignorance? Or do you, do you hesitate to speak the gospel to certain people because you think, maybe even I haven't even articulated this, you find that they're too far from the grace of Jesus for the grace of Jesus to reach them? Well, what is behind that? It is pride. That betrays our thinking that there is something in us that made God desire us. It is that same pride and presumption as the Nazarenes have here. And so Jesus tells us the same thing today as he told them. Jesus will go to the Gentiles. Jesus is a Messiah for others. He has sheep that are not of this flock that he will get. And he will get his glory in saving the blind and the lame. He will save the very likes of those that you and I ha have presumed he couldn't. Because that's one of the ways that he is going to get his glory. He will save by grace. And he will magnify his grace in saving the chief the chiefs of sinners. How does your heart then respond to that? Beware. For the synagogue of Nazareth responded with a heart of murder. Again, that escalated so quickly. How quickly it changed. Or, or rather, it's not a change. This is instead not a quick change, but this is a quick, quick revelation of what was deep in their hearts that just at the right point, at the right time, under the right circumstances, it just came right to the surface. It bubbled up. Friends, that makes us all the more need to analyze our hearts because maybe it hasn't yet bubbled up. We need to be testing, is there that pride? Is there something in us that is presuming that we, we deserve God's grace? Other people don't. Friends, test your hearts this morning. They were filled with wrath. They would not hear that Jesus might give signs to, to others that were unworthy places and not his fellow Nazarenes. They would not hear that Jesus might bless the Gentiles and not his fellow Jews. They have advanced the cliffs, which were, cliffs which were typical of that region, because they were going to throw Jesus down. Now again, uh, those of you who've been with us through this series, think of, of, of Satan awaiting an opportune time. Satan couldn't get Jesus to throw himself from the temple, could he? Can he get the Nazarenes to throw him from a cliff? Well, it seemed like they're just about to 
But no, not today. Satan's time will come, but his time was not then. Jesus passed through their midst. We're not told exactly how, but God preserved Jesus' life that day. God will only let them get so far, but their heart was definitely there. But again, that begs the question, what about your heart? And so I ask you this morning, simple question. What will you do with Jesus? Do you want salvation from him? Now, again, if if you want salvation, that actually says not something not only about Jesus, he's Messiah, he's the son of God. It says something about you. Do you see yourself as the wretch that you are? Blind to my own spiritual need. Uh, I'm a captive. Do you see yourself as a sinner? We are born poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. We need salvation. We need a Savior. We need grace. And praise God that Jesus came to give grace, and not just to us, but to save all of his elect of every tribe, nation, and tongue, even people that will not look like us, to show his mercy among all the nations, not just ours, to save sinners, even the worst of us. Some respond to this good news with murder. But may it be that our hearts will respond with joy. God saves wretches like you and me. And yes, he's going to save all of his elect. And yes, he's going to, he can do far more than we can ask or think. And yes, he can save those people that are so far gone that, that we need to stop saying they're so far gone that we need to say, Lord, would you save them? We need to be praying. We need to have eyes of faith to see the glory of Jesus Christ. We need to see the power of God that he can do all of his chosen, he can save all of his chosen people. He can save to the uttermost all those who by his power will repent and trust in him. So this morning, let Jesus expose your heart and may it be a harvest this morning of hearts that glorify God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, forgive us Forgive us for where we have, we have been the proud. Forgive us where we have thought little of you, Lord Jesus, and we have, we have limited your power because we thought you would, you would act according to our priorities. Lord, we see that where that leads in this passage. Nazarenes uh, thinking that a Nazarene will do as Nazarene does. Jesus, you're not like us. Let us love that. Lord, change our hearts that we would be conformed to your desires. And Lord, we delight in your mercy and grace. Again, Lord, forgive us, but Lord, fill us as well. Lord, that we would gain this sight and vision of your glory. Lord, that we would, uh, we would be conformed to you. Lord, that we would be growing in this. And Lord, would, would all the Gentiles be brought in? Will all of your elect? Uh, Lord, use us for that purpose. Transform us by your power. And Lord, we do rejoice in that you have saved wretches such as us. Lord, that you have saved the the poor, the captive, the blind, and oppressed. That was us. And so, Lord, be glorified in carrying that work to completion. And Lord, would you change hard hearts. And Lord, that you would be glorified in in doing this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.